You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for February 28th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where an unsupervised room full of sugared up preschoolers are more orderly than a democratic debate, it's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Giving up worrying about the Democratic primaries for Lent. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Or at least for the next week or so. Because yeah. uh, ain't nobody vote. Well, you can vote early in, in Illinois, but our, our primary isn't until August, I think, or September. Isn't that right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It's March 17th. Oh, that's it's, right. I it's, forgot. It's two weeks after Super Tuesday. I forgot. It's super, super duper Tuesday. Um <laughs> And, and our, I don't know. I, I don't know if we vote by ourselves or if there are other. I think there's a couple other primaries that day. Yes. But as I told you this morning, Drift Glass. Yes. Regardless of what we would say today about yeah. the Democratic race, it will Doesn't, be completely different seven no. days from now. So yes. I'm going to just not talk about that. Well, as you know, Blue Gal, we strive for a timeless eternal quality <laughs> in our commentary that can stand up to rigorous analysis like a day later. <laughs> unlike unlike pundits who uh, like to forget what they said a week ago, you know the iron the uh, Beltway Iron Rule of David Brooks, right? Yes, the, uh, it is forbidden to speak of what David Brooks uh, wrote a week ago. It is mandatory to to quote him today. So right. or the other way around. I'm sorry, it's our no, own rule. No, you're I exactly it right. Um, it, no, it, no, you didn't. It's exact. You had it exactly right. Oh, good for it, me. It is required that you quote david brooks's latest column to him on television yes and then he goes yes that's right and uh as i said to you i i do give kudos this week to john berman and allison camarota of uh, cnn who had on a gentleman from this seems feels like a year ago as usual uh he had on a gentleman from axios this this bombshell about groundswell and Ginny Thomas yes, 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 coming up with a list of people to purge from the White House. Gosh, have we, we've forgotten all about that. That was like Tuesday. Mm-hmm. But Jonathan Swan of Axios was on, and they made fun of the fact that we're going to read your column from Axios to you now. Yes, yes. And and they, may, they knew they were being <sighs> ridiculous reading something that, you know, just to introduce the same segment. So good on them for not doing that David Brooks trick of allow yeah. me to read your column to you and have you agree with it, you know? Yeah. Well, and for those of you who are just joining us in the middle of the 2020 election, and I've never heard this <laughs> podcast before, um, we, we, we've been doing this for 10 years now. Um, right? And we've been blogging now for you and me for 15 years now. Um, and I'm a veteran of Kennedy 80. Yeah. So yeah. so we were, we, we were writing back in the days – um, before there was a guy named David Gregory running Meet the Press. Yeah. So, you know, when people talk about Meet the Press and, oh, I long for the days of Tim Russert, I don't because I right. actually remember what he was like. And they skip right over this entire period in the middle where David Gregory was just as bad as Chuck Todd. This is not going to be the Chuck Todd podcast. I'm making yeah. the point. The point being, for a very long time, uh, it, it is inexplicable to me, remains inexplicable to me, why certain – New York Times house pets like David Brooks and Tom Friedman keep getting invited on television when they're always horribly wrong. And the reason is they have friends in the business. So for a long time, David Gregory, the host of Meet the Press, would either have David Brooks on and then read him his own column and ask him what he thought about it. Right. right. Or he wouldn't be there because he was busy jerking off to some other, you know, corner of the internet or some other television or channel. Or he was or, taking a rich person's vacation so he yes. could write about it. Yes. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> and then David Gregory would just read his column anyway and ask other people what they thought about it. And so that's the universe. That's the media universe that we have been smothering under for decades. And so um, And a lot you, of it has to do with it being content to fit bland content yes. to fill the space between pharma commercials. I mean, well, that's absolutely what it is. Yeah. And there's no, there's no doubt that that's the, the business model is to there. There's a certain type of person that they want 
to push to the front of every cable news show, uh, every Sunday morning show, every um, op-ed column in the country. And they're all the same people. That's that's the thing that just creeps me the hell out. They're all the same people, and they all have the same opinions. And this week, it really did feel like 2003 all over again. Well, let's let's talk very specifically, because I you tweeted uh-huh. uh, something to the effect of, Warning people about David Brooks for 15 years apparently isn't enough. Right. <laughs> and no. I said, no, it isn't. We have to podcast about this today because last week, I'm going to quote what David Brooks said last week. His his column was about how awesome Mike Bloomberg is, right? Yes. Mike Bloomberg is, first of all, let's, let's be fair. Mike Bloomberg is white and rich and has a penis, as you pointed out earlier today. As far as I know. <laughs> uh, therefore, he is all things David Brooks. Right cares about and knows and loves um he's also four feet tall which david brooks is like three and a half feet tall so mike bloomberg's very tall guy compared to david brooks but again i cannot stress this enough he's very very rich and there's Mm -hmm. nothing david brooks admires more than rich white men and so when rich white man came to the table and said i'm gonna put a big bag of money on the table and and run for president david brooks just passed out from excitement he was Thrilled. Well, and it, it's the don't touch my stuff party right. that David Brooks loves the most. So mm-hmm. Bloomberg is in the race to protect rich people from the taxes that will inevitably come from a Sanders Warren presidency. And then Michael and Bloomberg then this opened week his it mouth. Was, oh my god! Well, yeah, and and Bloomberg shit the bed, right? Twice. I mean, he's twice. And, he's and terrible. His, last week, Michael Bloomberg was the hero of David Brooks's column, and this week it was never Bernie Sanders. No, no. And in between, Michael Bloomberg opened his mouth. Yeah, and and the poll, his poll numbers are now. He's horrible. Really, he's just horrible. Probably, he's yeah. not used to dealing with anybody, and in this way, he really is like David Brooks. He's not used to dealing with anyone who ever disagrees with him. David Brooks never, ever goes to a venue where anyone ever asks him any questions, uh, any hard questions. He goes to only to venues where people praise him and stroke him and talk about a wise person he is, even when he's on opposite a putative liberal like E.J. Dion um, or Mark Shields. Uh, worst case, they they sort of shake their waddles at him and just go, well, I, I, I'm going to disagree <laughs> slightly with my good friend David Brooks here. With my and then friend, they talk David about Brooks, some little yeah. marginal shit that they, do, that, they, that they argue about. But no one – David Brooks lives in a media world that's built this way. It's built like pe- by people like Mike Bloomberg and the Schulzberger family. It's, it's a terrarium in which people like that are completely – insulated from the stupidity and catastrophe of their own opinions. So they get to keep blathering decade after decade. Brooks has been uh, uh, the New York Times, I think, now for 17 years. Tom Friedman, about whom we will talk in a little bit, has been at the New York Times for 28 years and has sucked every oh goddamn gosh. year of that. 28, 28 years. years? Yeah, 28 years. years. 28 fucking years. Um, different hats, different bylines, but he's been pulling off the Schulzberger teat for 28 years. And so at this point, you have to un- you have to know there's something just drastically wrong with the media, where this could just keep going on and on and on and on, and it never stops. So Mike Bloomberg made the mistake of standing up and opening his mouth <laughs> and saying things and got gutted like a trout, uh, mostly by Elizabeth Warren, bless her heart, um, as we discussed on last week's podcast. And so this week, now that his hero has been you know, laid waste, now that Superman is dead, um, David Brooks... Uh, is tearing his hair out and wrote a an impassioned, terrified column entitled No, Not Sanders, Not Ever. Because he's going to take away my stuff. And David Brooks, in his 800 contractually obligated words, proceeds to condescendingly explain to poor, stupid liberals like me what it means to be a liberal. <laughs> and, and really just does he traditional- mention Edmund Burke? Yeah, I, I believe he does. Um, <laughs> traditional liberalism traces. Liberals, liberals believe. Why liberals do this? Liberals celebrate. Liberals are horrified. Liberals confront. Liberals see this. Liberals see that. It's the standard issue. If you've ever read David Brooks' columns, first of all, why ever would you? I'm, do, I'm here to do that for you. It's the same algorithm he uses to produce every other fucking column. It is, there's, there's a rhythm to it. It is banal. It is, it, it is completely ignorant of the facts. It takes historical events and just mushes them together to make his stupid point. But at the end of the day, it is, I am never, ever, ever going to vote for Bernie Sanders, ever. And of course he's not, because Bernie Sanders is everything that David Brooks hates. 
Mm-hmm. It's not that Bernie Sanders is going to um, actually overthrow the the system, although he might get away with it. He might not. I don't know. But David Brooks, um, this is why you never trust a never Trumper mm-hmm. because they, they they will say they have your back and they're with you in the in the foxhole right up until it gets real uncomfortable, and then they will stab you in the back and run away. So David Brooks is going to vote for Jill Stein, I guess. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question about that though, because my understanding mm-hmm. from David Brooks's column is. Now that Bernie has some delegates under his wing, right? right. I mean, he's actually mm-hmm. going to the camp. We, we have no predictions to make, but no, not at all. he's going to the convention with some delegates for yeah. sure. He's packing heat. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, now David Brooks is saying, well, I would have voted for Warren. Sure, I would have voted for Warren. <laughs> I would have voted for Warren. And, you can, and the screeching sound you hear are goalposts being dragged right, further down right, the field. Right, right, That's a bunch um, of bullshit. Remember, David Brooks lies all the time. Uh-huh, David yeah. Brooks lies as often as Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity. He just does mm-hmm. it in kind of a white shoe, aw shucks, soft voiced New York Times kind of way. But if you listen to if you read him or follow him at any point uh, over the course of his career, you see, oh, shit, he's just bullshitting. He, he just pulls stuff out of his ass. He he makes shit up. He makes people up and imputes opinions to them, uh, opinions that invariably uh, sort of gel with his own. He's horrible. And so this week he decided it was time to lecture liberals on what it means to be a liberal and explain why he's never, ever, 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 ever going to vote for Bernie Sanders ever again. Ever, period. Not again, just never. Um, and I pulled out two little things in my post, which you, you're more than welcome to read. One is uh, the David Brooks story about where he got to become a conservative when he was a little boy. Um, and I think David Brooks has some real serious daddy issues. I think that's what's going on here just a little bit. And uh, I pulled something from the late, great Stephen Gilliard from 17 years ago, uh, about what it means to be a fighting liberal. Mm. And you know what? If, if it weren't for liberals, you'd be living in a dark and evil country right now. Right. You know, we'd be a German satellite at this point. Conservatives are the fucking brown shirts in this story. And David Brooks will side with... A, a genteel form of fascism every time. And if it really is all hands on deck, and it really is everyone, 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 we need to take down this the fascist Republican government because they have destroyed democracy and they're about to put their imprint on this country forever, then I don't want to hear another goddamn word from any never-Trumper about how Democrats run their primaries. Believe me, I have stated repeatedly my own serious objections to the way the Democratic primary process has been run to date. Mm-hmm. I have my favorite candidates. You have your favorite candidates. Here's one thing I think we can all agree on. If you voted Republican up until five minutes ago, if you were a Republican operative or support person or you were on television or had an op-ed column with conservative after your name up until five minutes ago, you have no goddamn business saying a goddamn word about how Democrats conduct anything. You wrecked your party. So turn your ass around and go fix it or get in the boat with the rest of us and do some hard work. But whatever you do, shut up about how Democrats are doing their business. Because none of your tweet goddamn about business. sports for the rest of your life. No. They don't pay David Brooks to tweet about sports. Yeah, they, right. they pay him to tweet about politics and religion, and in between some you know horrible, um, uh, mealy mouthed, maudlin bullshit about America and the American dream and bipartisanship and so on and so forth. And the other end of the spectrum, by the way, not the other end of the spectrum, but you might remember, uh, I also wrote a little post this week about one of the um, um, shocking revelations. That, uh, that that the Trump administration has revealed is that uh, Tom Friedman still has a job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I had I had because I used to re- write about Friedman and and uh, Andrew Sullivan and David Brooks all the time to the point of it, it bored me. Um, and I managed to put Tom Friedman out of my mind for a long time, and then he got on his hobby horse this week and did so it did his thing to the point where it really is a fight between Schulzberger family pets. Friedman and Brooks over who can have the most horrible take on what we should do about politics. Uh, David Brooks is, I'm never voting for Bernie Sanders ever, ever, ever. I'm taking my toys and going home. Uh, Tom Friedman's column was, here's what we should do. And it, uh, we should take little bits of every person I like or, or things they've said or speeches they've said or whatever. We should take a little bit of Mitt Romney and a little bit of Michael Bloomberg or a lot of Mike Bloomberg because he's short and he's rich and I like that. And some Elizabeth Warren and stitched together sort of a Franken party, 
out of all the pieces that I think are cool. And that's the way you build a giant coalition to make everybody happy. And, and what he means by that is grand bargain too, yes, right? He means he means his and, and uh, his party. And I, I point out in the um, in the post I wrote this week also is that he does this all the time. He and David Brooks are every every six to eight months write another fucking column about how a third party will save us, a new party will save us, a centrist party will save us, a consensus party will save us. None of which has ever happened or is even ever close. Well, to it's going to be funded by Mike Bloomberg. Yes. And and that's right. It to, it's to protect the banks. That's what it's for. Well, in fact, and my in, bank stocks are the most important thing in America. In, that's in the, the message. In, I, I pull up a, an old uh, article from, I forget which year it was. It was from the Columbia Journalism Review mm -hmm. from 2011. Uh, they're talking about this persistent, creepy fetish that, 2011, mind you, that Tom Friedman has for, for his ideal third party. And his ideal third party, they, they quote, is like, it's time for Barack Obama to get some sort of fantasy vice president and they say Michael Bloomberg, perhaps. <laughs> um, it, it it is, and it is something he just does over and over and over again. And yeah. at some point, yeah. it it's like his critique of the Iraq War. At some point, it becomes ridiculous. Yeah. And at some point, any newspaper that had any self respect would would bench his ass, mm -hmm. would pension him off. But he just runs naked and wild through the pages of the New York Times every goddamn week, saying stupid shit like this. And it's like the Schulzberger family died and left the paper to a dog. And the dog doesn't know anything except repeating the same thing over and over and over again. So this week, uh, I believe Brett Stevens had a similar bullshit take in the New York Times. David Brooks has his take and Tom Friedman has his look. Here's what we need to do. Take 20% Michael Bloomberg and 12% Bernie and 8% Elizabeth Warren and Elizabeth Ocasio-Cortez can do this. And Mitt Romney would make a great commerce secretary. <laughs> and he's really just seriously to protect the bank stocks. Yep. Yes. And yep. he's playing. He's playing. He's playing with toys. He's playing with and, army and soldiers. And Driftless means Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Just yes, I do. So we're clear. Okay. I blur, I blur my words sometimes, but he's he's playing with army soldiers in his giant rich boy backyard. Yeah. Here's something yeah. to be cool. Look, we'll take Batman and we'll take the Joker and we'll take and Superman, Superman <laughs> and then we'll get some people from the Marvel universe and it'll be really cool and we'll have a super a super great good time. Right, everyone, and anyone who is you know paid by him or beholden to him or terrified that he's going to yank their chain will say, "Oh yeah, absolutely." Again, which is what he has something in common with Mike Bloomberg. Hey, Drift Class, you wanted to yes. give out an award this week. I did. The there is no one more oppressed than me award. We gave oh, this yes. out last week as well. Yes. Right. Well, it was it was self evident who the most oppressed person was last week. Yeah. It was it, poor uh, Rod Blagojevich. <laughs> Uh, who <laughs> suffered mightily at the hands of Pontius Pilate and yeah. was buried and rose from the dead and came back to screw up Illinois politics yet again, uh, who had a press conference to talk about how oppressed he was and how awful he was and how horribly he was treated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this week, the award goes out to Mark Halperin, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. who showed up at in some basement on some panel uh, in some, uh, 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 some discussion group where, according to the reporter in The Nation, the audience was made up almost entirely of the public relations firm that sponsored the event. Yeah. So you know it's good. Yeah. To talk about how – and there was there was like – there were three or four reporters there. That's it. And he he was there to talk about how awful cancel culture is and how unfair it is and how, mm -hmm. you know, there must be a way for for someone like me to to get back into the good graces of the public. And, yes, what I did was wrong, but really – depriving me of the ability to to have a job and and get health care for my children is so cruel and unfair oh and for, you mean like all, with medicare for all is that yeah, what he's talking well, about no here's the thing first of all <laughs> let's remember that mark halperin was terrible at his job well it was, was great news for john mccain it was it's always great news for john mccain <laughs> Um, I my favorite is is him doing bouncy bouncy on uh, in, in the Trump helicopter, looking just right. so happy to be yep. floating around. Mark Halperin was just awful at his job. He gave huh? a trophy to Ted Cruz for being the first candidate to announce in 2012 that he was running for president. Yeah, that was that was Mark Halperin's way of being insider beltway. Yeah, well, Mark and Mark Halperin would appear, if I'm not mistaken, on either Glenn Beck or Sean Hannity's show, and you know he was he was always considered one of the good ones by those mm -hmm. guys. Yeah. So and yeah. so I, I cannot emphasize enough how 
really, really horrible Mark Halpern was at his job. Well, maybe he and, wants a job on the blaze, though. Well, maybe, maybe he does. You know, my point being, being really, really objectively <laughs> horrible at your job is never enough to get you fired from your job. If right. you are in the media club, you have to do something else. You have yep. to get caught sexually predating right. on lots With your of women. penis out in an elevator yes. threatening then, a woman's job what about all the jobs that he threatened while he was doing that you know if you're gonna drag if you're gonna split hairs if we're gonna, <laughs> this is this yeah. is why liberals are so hated blue gal because they're it's never enough you're not and, and all the millions and millions and millions he made from bloomberg um, bloomberg the, yeah the, ironically yeah the, yes. the media corporation um all the privilege he had he wrote a shitty book uh, that nobody bought because nobody yeah. wants to hear from Mark Halpern ever again. Um, he has friends. He has friends mm-hmm. in the media. Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski keep trying to feed him table scraps. Mm-hmm. You know, let's get it yeah. back on the air. And everyone, no. Well, let's yeah. have a special online thing where we'll listen to his opinion. And you want to shake them and say, why are you so fucking hell bent on this one guy? making get? And I think the, the answer is because. If they can do it to him, they can do it to anyone. If Mark Halperin can lose his place at the trough, then for whatever reason, then none of us are safe. We need to make sure that that once you're inside the charm circle, that nothing can cast you out. And that once you're cast out, you, you're out for like, we used to call it a full Halperin. One month. I mean, when, when uh, Newt Gingrich was being groomed over and over again as, a, as the next great American a uh, political commentator by David Gregory. Mm-hmm. Every so often, Newt Gingrich would say something incredibly incendiary or racist or awful, and David Gregory would have to ignore him for a month, and he'd sit on the bench, and then he'd bring him right back. And that's this is the procedure. You Good do class. horrible I'm gonna, shit. I'm going to add another layer to this conversation, though, that I, I think Please is do. very timely. Uh, yeah. This week's mess of a debate and how – you know, we just utterly blame CBS for being terrible. And I mean, come on, selling a Mike Bloomberg ad during the debate to Mike Bloomberg is just wrong. They did a terrible job moderating. And the Medicare for all. It was failed. And the Medicare was... for all will kill us all. <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was an ad in the middle of there about how Medicare for all will just kill everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the oh, yeah, of that the one Democratic from that debate. lobbying organization. Yeah. But there was yeah. a moment in the debate where Elizabeth Warren brought up with Bloomberg this accusation that has been witnessed by a man. So it might be true men out there. Who knows? Um, We don't, you know, who knows? She has an NDA. So, uh, but this claim that uh, a pregnant woman within the Bloomberg organization faced workplace discrimination. Mm -hmm. And the reviews that came out from men, including, Chris Matthews was that, the, oh, this felt like a thud. It was it was not a thing she should have brought up. It made her look angry, which, right. you know, Ooh. apparently never supposed to look angry, Elizabeth Warren. God forbid. Uh, the the Halpern thing, the Bloomberg thing, and the Warren thing is all the mainstream media underestimating how angry women are. Yes, yes. And women don't tweet about their pregnancy discrimination. <laughs> they just don't. No. You want to keep your job. You want to keep your head low, and you hope that you you won't be demoted or lose your job over pregnancy, even though that's against the law. Companies violate that law all the time. And Mike Bloomberg's response to Elizabeth Warren was so telling. Uh, he said two things in response to her statement. You know, there was a woman who's got an NDA who there's a witness and apparently Mike Bloomberg said in response to this woman having being pregnant on the job and needing to look a certain way, the words kill it came up. Right. That's the claim. Yeah. And uh, (laughs) Mike Bloomberg's uh, response to Elizabeth Warren was twofold. One is uh, about Elizabeth Warren's own story of facing workplace discrimination for being pregnant. Well, that would have never happened in New York City under me. Uh huh. Uh, Mike Bloomberg was mayor of New York City in 2002. 
And federal law had been changed in 1978 to ban workplace discrimination against pregnant women. So, and, and Mike Bloomberg personally passed it in 1978. <laughs> no, just, no, so he you know. didn't. no, he didn't. No, he didn't. He no, bought okay. it like he bought all of the House members that he claims he purchased uh-huh. during the debate as well. That was yeah. a fun line. That was a fun uh, line. Yep. Yeah. The other thing <laughs> that Mike Bloomberg said was, "If she heard me that way, I'm sorry." Yeah. Yeah, if I offended you. That is gaslighting boss talk Mm -hmm. that every woman heard in that debate, who listened to that debate, who listened to that mess of a debate. When you hear Mike Bloomberg say that, every woman has had a boss like that, who when they're caught, who when management comes down and says, what were you talking about? You know, did you mention her tits? Are you, you know, behaving in a way that damages our reputation in the workplace. Well, if she heard it that way, I'm really sorry. I didn't. Yeah. He, she heard it a certain way. I didn't intend. You know how chicks are. It's yeah. bullshit. Yeah. And so this, this is the thing with helper and with, you know, Mika Brzezinski. Well, why can't we give him a chance to apologize? <laughs> Come on. People. You don't understand how angry and damaged Every woman has been through this in the workplace. Every single one has been Mm -hmm. through something where they've been talked to in a certain way or touched in a certain way or told something. And it doesn't have to be, I, I closed the office door and raped her. It doesn't have to go to that extent ever. It can go to, you know, Hey, sugar tits or whatever. Every woman's been through it, Mm -hmm. been through being made uncomfortable while at work because you are a woman. Yes. And that anger is fueling our politics today. Uh Under the surface, women are not tweeting about it. Women are not Facebooking about it. They're just (laughs) stewing. Yeah. And let's hope that that turns into – I think it has turned into action. I think that's one reason we had 40 seats won in the House of Representatives. I think that's why women are getting elected all over the place is people have had it. Mm -hmm. I hope so. The other thing that just – floors me in this whole discussion is any discussion in medium blogs or you know the ladders or whatever saying well men don't know how to behave anymore three little fucking words you're at work yeah i don't <laughs> that's i don't know it. why this is so it's hard not a to cocktail understand. bar it's not a strip club unless you're working in a strip no. club no you know even if you're working in a strip men who work in a strip club behave better than some men do in office spaces. In Usually because there are spaces. armed men who make them do There's that. There's cops around. Yeah. 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 You know what? Here's <laughs> a bouncers. thought. bouncers. Yes. Let's put bouncers in every office in America. Right. To a bounce full, you a, out of there the and, minute you and, say sugar tits. Yeah. We'll just be walking up and down the aisle. Go, hey, 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 mister. Why don't you just step outside for a little while? That's what we need is, yeah. you know, 400 pound guys uh-huh. <laughs> with a stick saying, uh, you know, buddy, you need some air. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Let me buy you a drink, okay? Because mm-hmm. like you've had too much. It's time for you to go home. But it's 10 I o'clock. I called you well, a cab. I, yeah. <laughs> then I guess you're fired, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and the other thing that just specifically to Elizabeth Warren was this mystification about why she didn't use her superpowers. Because, you know, she has superpowers, super Wiccan powers mm-hmm. to take Bernie Sanders out instead of Mike Bloomberg. I love just, Charlie Pierce on this, that yeah, somehow oh, it was her job. It's her job to take right. out Bernie Sanders. Right. That's her job. Mm-hmm. And, and here's the thing. It might. Um, let me explain this real slow for the political <laughs> cynics out there who are like, don't understand how people of good conscience behave in a public place. Right. Maybe Elizabeth Warren, as she said a million times, actually agrees with most of what Bernie Sanders says. Yeah. She's, Maybe, she's in a lot of his policies and admitted that they're his ideas yeah and maybe she's a little bit sick of every time they sort of scale back their stuff or they come into closer alignment um some of his followers trash her for it which she did mention but that's that's a follower problem that's not a leader problem that's not bernie Bernie does not do that um maybe she just thinks she would be better at implementing them she'd be better as a president than Bernie Sanders would be, which is an honest disagreement, which is why they're both in the race. Maybe she thinks the real problem, the real glaring, superating boil on the ass of American democracy is standing five feet to her right, and his name is Michael Bloomberg. 
Yep. Because he's a he, he's got sixty billion dollars and he's an asshole and he thinks he can buy an election and mm-hmm. he is everything she can't stand about politics and banking and privilege and, and all that yep. and corruption yep. and he is he is her wheelhouse. Yep. So a person of good conscience who has been fighting against oh I don't know the oil industry let's say if they were running against an oil executive might want to take that person on because that is what they believe in. Mike Bloomberg, as I said, is her wheelhouse. It doesn't surprise me that she was gloves off mostly Bernie Sanders because they tend to agree on things. What right. does surprise me is that all the other moderates in the race, if you want to go after Bernie Sanders, go do it. He's standing right there. Yeah. And to a certain extent, they did. But the debate was such a shouty, shout, shout mess that the CBS it, debate this yeah, week CBS is when you're talking was, about. was just yeah. a mess. The moderators had failed. Um, and I've been at meetings like this <laughs> where leadership <laughs> just, just falls apart and, and, and everyone's shouting and everyone's, everyone's trying to get to the you know, cream cheese and everyone's ar- wants to argue about their shit and no one's running everything. And oftentimes I am tempted to step into a leadership role where there's a vacuum. And then I realize there's no percentage in that for me. Right. You're Except not going to get your way by, by banging a gavel and saying let's come to no, order right. right no and everyone there had a reason to shout over everyone else because everyone's applying for the same job and so there's no there's no structure to it so everyone is going to try to outdo everyone else when there's no rules it's a scrum for who gets hold of the conch and right. you know the talking stick and si- since there were no rules everyone made a grab for it and it turned into a hot mess now there were good moments there um, I admit there were people who did uh, a better job than others. Um, I thought, for example, uh, uh, Joe Biden's answer about his Catholic school training was a nice touch. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I thought um, that this is something that didn't happen, um, but should have. Uh, Bloomberg was always two minutes away from his please clap moment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. He's just, yeah. he's sad. But when you rent your own cheering section, it doesn't really matter, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, our our uh, friend of the pod, Frangela Duo, uh, pointed out something on Twitter I'd like to mention, which is when you expunge the records of – would you expunge the records of the black and brown people that you harassed into jail? Mike Bloomberg talked about record expungement and nobody took up the bat and said, wait a minute. How many of those people are in jail because of you, motherfucker? Right, and, right. And so it was a moment missed. I thought um, – Amy Klobuchar's answer about uh, about the coronavirus was good. Mm-hmm. I thought mm-hmm. Mayor Pete name checking his spouse as a teacher was a nice touch. Yeah. He also had yeah. some pretty clever answers that were pretty clearly scripted, but he is good at scripted ad libs in the same way that Bloomberg is horrible at it. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, and and uh, War- uh, Elizabeth Warren did nothing to make me doubt that she would be a very good president. Um, and Bernie Sanders is Bernie Sanders. He is for me. For me, is. His most effective when he uses humor uh-huh. and, cal- and calmly explains, as one would to a slow child, <laughs> why certain things are the way they are yeah. and why yeah. they need to be fixed and why the current system is broken. Yeah. That works for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But other than that, it was just, you know, it was a, what do they say about a hockey game? A f- there was a brawl and a hockey game broke out. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a food yeah. fight and occasionally a little debate poked through, but that's it. And, and it was, really, oh, we should go to uh, and and run all the ads you want, but we should go to town halls. We should. The, we should. the CNN town halls this week were really good, and people mm-hmm. got to ask questions. Yeah, and uh, see the candidates. I am tired of hearing Elizabeth Warren's hearing aid story, but yeah. I'm really wired into politics and ha- and watching yes. it all the time. And if you're a South Carolina voter who hasn't paid attention mm-hmm. uh, before then you got to hear that story again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but And you got to hear it without interruption or hand raving or or a commercial from Mike Bloomberg. You know, you right. got to hear it. Uh, so uh, I think those town halls are a much better way to look at the candidates. And you'll still get clips from those on the internet and people mm-hmm. will, will see them. And uh, you can get zingers through. You can do all kinds of things as a candidate with those town halls that are yeah. much less messy. Well, and I, or I was suggesting I was on the um, um, Nicole Sandler show today of this mm-hmm. week. Yes. And we, we sort of went over this, some of the same material, but I would love to see a sort of a seated 
so everyone doesn't have to stand at a podium and have to pee for two hours. Right, right. A, a, a seated roundtable discussing one issue. Mm -hmm. You know, climate change got no coverage at all right, in this debate. Right, I, I would like to see them sitting in a circle, at drum or no drum, I don't really care. Um, maybe smoking pot, that'd be great. <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever's available, whatever your recreational, you know, of choice is, I don't really care. Um, and talk about one subject, just one subject for an hour. I think that'd be a, a healthy, public, grown-up debate. I have never missed the League of Women Voters more than I right. missed them um, right. during this debate because it was such a it was such a clearly crass commercial enterprise. You know, and having that, having morning show hosts, you know, who are used to doing, I don't know, fashion shows or whatever they do on in the morning shows, I just don't think that that makes it serious. No. Oh, they gave so, up right away. They just saw, yeah, oh, this is right. going off the rails. Well, what the hell? Let's just let it run. They, they, they had rules. They didn't enforce them. It was a hot mess. Everyone agrees it was a hot mess. Um, and it was just an embarrassment. An embar and democracy is way too important to be left in the hands of game show type tactics like that. Exactly. Exactly. Where do you want to go from here? Do you want to talk about the forum in Springfield that you went to yeah. this morning? Yeah, it was at a, a forum, forum this morning. Um, young, successful, and black in Springfield. Um, I'm none of those. So it was something uh, for me to uh, for me to enjoy. I, I knew a lot of the people there. I knew a lot of the people in the audience, and it was extremely interesting to have four young, successful African Americans on a panel talking about their lived experience, talking about their family, talking about uh, what brought them to this place in their life, the importance of church and the importance of school and 4-H and what it's like to be the was only. This a, was this a business panel or a political panel or, it was a, or what? It was a success panel. It was just okay. uh, one of the gentlemen uh, is the head of the um, Black Chamber of Commerce in Springfield. Okay. He's okay. also on the panel of the Citizens Club, which is the thing that sponsors these civic sort of discussion groups every month. Mm -hmm. And he got them and persuaded them, and they didn't have to uh, do any arm bending. This was just an idea that was long overdue to have. I, I think, excuse me, I think you just dropped a bomb in the middle of our podcast. It's important to, for people to understand why there's a Black Chamber of Commerce yes. in Springfield. There is a Black Chamber it's of not, Commerce in Springfield. It's not segregation. No, no. <laughs> Black um, Chamber of Commerce is there to support the growth of black businesses by black business owners. Yes. It is a self-started organization uh, of black businessmen. So, and one, one and of the women, things and women, yeah. One of the things he wasn't he was on the panel, he wasn't the moderator, but one of the things he did was have everyone in the audience who was who came up through the ranks, who was in a leadership position, who was African American, who um uh etc cetera, etc cetera, stand up in the audience there were you know there were 40 people 30 people standing up and he said right you know people who want to complain in this town that we're not active we're not involved we're not in touch all of us are exhausted because we all sit on every board because we're never allowed to say no because once you say no once they'll never ask you back again so right right and everyone talked about their grandmother and talked about the, the important adult in their life and and the youth programs and it was just an incredibly impressive group of people talking about how they have come to this place in their life mm -hmm. and how exhausted they are because they are working all the time yeah um because their parents were like you have to be twice as good as everybody else you have to succeed right. and there's no no excuse but working harder um two things that jumped out at me many many things that jumped out at me but two i'll mention here one is this frustration with mentioning something over and over again and then a year later some white person says it and it becomes uh, a heroic epiphany that everyone yeah. gathers around like and you're sitting there going wait a minute did i just say that like 17 times over the last two years and and nobody paid any attention because i was invisible very much like women in the workplace and harassment they're just yep it, it doesn't exist because i don't, I choose not to see it uh, a second thing that jumped out at me wa was when people were talking about barack obama as president and talking about their mom you know crying and everyone you know just weeping with joy and one woman said, but her grandmother, her grandmother did not react that way. Her grandmother was not impressed or, or was, was not, you know, overwhelmed. And, she, and, and when asked, she asked her granny why, and her grandmother said, first of all, she was afraid of what was going to happen to him. Yeah. Because she, she says, you know, I've lived in this country. I know what this country is like, and I'm terrified for him. Secondly, she was afraid of the backlash that was going to come after he left office. So and, once he was no longer president, she was afraid of the backlash. Yeah, and now and she we're was living, right. She was right. She's absolutely right. And the uh, and and people who thought, well, well, we're over it. Not over it, but we've we've turned a corner. 
Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> no, he didn't. She knew better than that. Yeah, yes, she she, she right. damn well because she lived the experience of we made a little progress, made a little progress, and then white folks just came in and tore it all down because they mm-hmm. couldn't tolerate the idea of of us being equal, of us succeeding. It was just in their bones. Um, now I, I'm just giving you my impression of what she said, mm-hmm. but it was it was a a really wonderful panel. It was well attended, um, and. Uh, it was a delight to see, but that lived experience of people who are, who are leading in their community and are invisible to everyone else because it's just part of the narrative that there are no black leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and people who want to believe that, you know, th- that we're making progress, we're making progress. I'm one of those people who want to believe it. And, and, but the lived experience is, yeah, but man, it can all be taken away from you so fast. Yeah. So fast. And well, and I what... think I think that's something that we have to address in the Democratic Party as far as how we handle the primaries as a yeah. party. Yes. Because the way South Carolina is being portrayed and advertised as the black primary yeah. is it's... segregation. It's segregation yeah. in the cat by calendar. That's yeah. what it is. Yep. And Nevada aside, which is a very diverse community very diverse electorate uh the the this this really is to me a, a segregationist calendar that we're dealing with we have the white primaries at the front we have a black primary this is when african american people are going to speak well what about the african americans in iowa what about yeah. you know it's yeah. not we need a calendar that allows all of us to have a say at, you know early it, within a diverse party yes. oh, and and this is going to have to be we're always adjusting things you know the democratic party always fixes what happened what was wrong with last time mm-hmm. this time and we fix it and then those <laughs> those rules that were changed last time aren't good enough for this time and right it, you know unfair. <laughs> they're unfair they're unfair now so well again we don't since our our primary is in December or January, is no, it? No, sure? <laughs> March seventeenth. <That's> March seventeenth. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, none of this applies to us because. Well, I, I do have one rule though. My mm-hmm. one rule is it's 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 always been my rule my entire life. Unless you unless you rally personally, rally in my state <laughs> repeatedly, and personally rally in my city repeatedly, <laughs> and come to my home and give me a goddamn cookie, I can't vote for you. Ah. I just can't. I can't do it. You know. He's so kidding. sorry, I'm kidding. I'm, but it's, He's it's kidding. I've gotten feedback, positive feedback from people who said, "Look, I never met Hillary Clinton. She never came to Minnesota. She didn't rally in my city. I still voted for her." Shut the fuck up about needing well, to have and, a cookie and, there and, and are have states your that don't. There are states that don't have primaries at all. You right. know, that just select the, their delegates from the state Democrats within the state, and they just don't. So. Anyway, uh, yeah, I've given up worrying about the Democratic nomination for Lent. Yeah, <laughs> I may come I can't. back to it. It's, I may come back to it sooner rather than later. But I, well, we for have this week for this we week. To worry about, you know. Yeah, we have a lot of other things to worry about. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, uh, and we're going to talk a lot about coronavirus in the yes. uh, news roundup, which is now. Let's yeah. do it. Well, and the CDC warned that the spread of the coronavirus in the United States appears to be quote inevitable, saying Americans should quote prepare for the expectation that this might be bad. While Trump said that the coronavirus is, quote, going to go away, maybe very soon, quote, like a miracle, or maybe not. We'll see. Trump attempted to downplay the risk, saying the virus is, quote, very well under control in our country. We think they'll be in very good shape very, very soon. Bullshit. He's surrounding surrounding himself by yes men and evangelicals who are promising him that, you know, he's God's chosen president. Yeah. And so there's going to be a miracle. Mm -hmm. And he is so susceptible to believing any good news about him. So it's it's a dangerous time. Acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, isn't he also management and budget as well? Yes, I he think is. So. He's acting a lot of things yeah. these days. Uh, yeah. He yeah. accused the press of peddling false narratives about the administration scrambling to to deal with the coronavirus. Let's blame everybody else. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. And because we live in a globalized society with global supply chains, global stocks fell as fears about the impact of the coronavirus continued to mount. German's DAX fell by 5% before leveling out, while Tokyo and Shanghai closed at 3.7 loss. This is not a stock program, but it's bad. 
the S&P is on track for the market's worst week since 2008 financial crash. And Donald Trump blamed the stock market drop on Bernie Sanders. And uh, Nancy Pelosi said, let's not be silly. (laughs) Sorry, too late. Too late, Nancy. The the real real plague is called the Republican Party. Honestly. Uh, So uh, Mick Mulvaney and Don Jr. and Laura Ingram are all accusing Democrats of trying to weaponize the coronavirus to make Trump look bad. Don Jr. said they just want to stop the winning. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The winning like in the midterms, you know, the winning. (laughs) Let's all get in the Wayback Machine and go back to talking about what uh, what Donald Trump was saying about Barack Obama. Yep. During the Ebola crisis, when Absolutely. Barack Obama mobilized resources and Barack Obama set up a, a, a special unit inside Homeland Security, all of which Donald Trump has torn down because Donald because the black guy did it. And we can't have that here. Of course, Republicans don't have any memory of anything that happened before yesterday. So that's all lost on them. Uh, there is a whistleblower who alleges that the Department of Health and Human Services, quote, improperly deployed more than a dozen workers to coronavirus quarantine locations who were not properly trained or equipped to operate in a public health emergency situation. They sent the dopes out to deal with a plague. So typical, typical Donald Trump stuff. The White House instructed government health officials and scientists to get approval from Mike Pence's office before speaking publicly about the coronavirus up- outbreak. Yes. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to pray the plague away. Uh, The Trump administration has indefinitely postponed a seawall to protect New York City six weeks after Donald Trump mocked the idea. I thought that was under construction already. Well, I guess not. Well, he's at war with New York State over immigration. So he's and because they want to sue him in court and take all his money away. So, yeah. And on that note, a federal appeals court ruled that the Trump administration can withhold law enforcement grant money from so-called sanctuary cities and states that don't cooperate with Stephen Miller's immigration ideas. Yeah, that's really dangerous. That's really, really dangerous. Now you have the ability to turn the entire federal government into an instrument of Donald Trump's revenge. And Uh, re-election campaign. Yeah. In a pure George W. Bush move, (laughs) <laughs> the White House has hired Jason Bacon, that's a real name, he's a 23-year-old college senior, to be one of the top officials of the Presidential Personnel Office. That is very W. It really him, is. Isn't if, it? If you were, if you were a, alive and aware during the Iraq War period, you might remember that people who ran t-shirt stands and, and ice cream trucks were put in charge of the banking system, the traffic system in Iraq, in Iraq after the yeah. war. Because they could answer one simple question. Where do you stand on Roe versus Wade? Oh, uh, two questions. And are you a contributor? Yep. That was it. That's how we managed to dis- to completely wreck American uh, foreign policy prestige. That's how we managed to destroy the nation of Iraq for a generation to come by doing exactly what Trump is doing now. Bush did exactly the same thing Trump is doing now. The director of the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement suppressed guidance from the agency's engineers when it overhauled a well drilling safety rule. Mm Because science isn't what you need, apparently. I am losing my mind over this stuff. Yeah. It's it's every everywhere you look. Every everywhere you look, there is some Trump stooge rolling back um public safety things, union safety things, air physics. safety things, physics, science, just yeah. because it makes them look bad or because the black guy did it for or no other reason. because they lose money if they do it that way. Yeah. And, and, and they're at lobbying. the other end of the pipeline, yeah, they're lobbyists, yeah. looting the government um, into their own pockets. And and once it all crashes, and it will inevitably crash, some poor goddamn Democrat is going to have to come in a clean house. And, and as they try to do so, you Don can Jr. Count. is going to be on Fox and Friends bitching about it. Don That's, Jr. will be on Fox yeah. and Friends, and Mitch McConnell will be in the Senate making sure that nothing gets done, that all the fires keep burning, and then we'll blame the next Democratic president for Donald Trump's failures. Uh, Donald Trump accused Adam Schiff, without any evidence whatsoever, of leaking classified information about Russian election interference to the media. Trump dismissed the intelligence community's assessment that Russia was meddling in the 2020 presidential election calling it hoax number seven. Hoax number seven. So he's and, numbering them now? Yeah, he just, he doesn't count. He can't, can't higher than four. So <laughs> it's just, just pull a number and a word out of his ass. They're all, he has a 40 word vocabulary. So whatever the Mad Lib is today is what it is. And 
I am so mad at Republicans. I am yeah. so I know. Live I, it. so yeah. loathe Republicans now. I really this is if you wanted to trigger a bunch of libs, congratulations, you've succeeded. I have absolutely lost any respect or patience with anyone with an R after their name. Don't want to hear a fucking word about you. And if you would like to start a fight in public by by pinpricking me with some smart ass comment, you go right ahead because I am loaded for bear and I'm coming for you. Um, now, in our local Democratic congressional primary, um, which you know that we uh, are working for Betsy Dirksen Lodergren, I'm phone banking for her. She was our candidate last time. She's, my, you can see our lawn sign if you drive past our house. Uh, the local, she does have an opponent, but the race is very, very lopsided. And um, and several, the reason we're talking about this is several listeners wrote us about yes. uh, a little blip in the news cycle that included this this race. Yeah. So. And we thought we'd mention it because it should never be mentioned again, <laughs> ironically. <laughs> um, uh, her campaign has more money on hand when last I checked than her Republican incumbent opponent. Um, and then she has the National Party on her side. She's an Emily's List choice. Right. She has Dick Durbin's organization behind her. So, you know, she's got she's 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 very well staffed and very she's well a for, She's a former Dick Durbin staffer. She's yeah. got legislative experience she knows how a bill gets to be a law she knows how to write bills yeah and she uh is as as the times that i have been at town halls and meetings with union people and so forth where she's been there she has been a careful listener a polite person and someone who seems like quite the technocrat like just yeah. somebody who really gets it that okay we may need a bill to do this and let's work on that. And, and she's not high drama no. at all. No. Um, and I think uh, she'd make a great Congresswoman. I do too. I, yeah. I, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, volunteer for her and I wouldn't yeah. uh, vote for her. Yeah. Uh, her opponent is named Stephanie Smith, um, who has about seven thousand, six thousand dollars in the bank and about enough supporters to fill out a hockey team. So it is incredibly lopsided. And so what some of her supporters tried to do was something very desperate to get some national media attention. They, they followed, they're stalking her campaign. They blocked her in, in her car and sort of Londrigan. screaming at they, they screamed they, at Londrigan. They, yeah. yeah. They blocked Londrigan into her car and they were screaming at her and, and, and live streaming the whole thing on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and what they managed to do was get national media attention for about 48 hours, really bad national media attention. Right. And, right. and, and their, their response was, well, then come debate us. Because that was the whole point. The point was, you know, they've already done one debate together. Um, they're going to lose. They're going to lose very, very badly. And the only hope they have is to get more attention with them. More, more free TV time. Yeah. And, and I more understand. free local TV time. Yeah. When, yeah. when you're losing and you know you're going to lose and it's that bad and you believe in your candidate and you're, you're a zealot. And the primary you, is 17 days away. Yeah. 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 You know, you do some desperate things. You yeah. you start throwing haymakers to try to just attract some attention, a couple more dollars, anything you can. So the only thing I have to say is this is a blip on the radar. Radar. It doesn't reflect on, generally speaking, Democratic politics. Uh, I believe they they had some like Bernie Sanders um, uh, merch they were selling on their site. It does not reflect on the Bernie Sanders campaign at all. This nope. is just a small local, um, horribly lopsided primary campaign with one mm -hmm. of the people desperately trying to get some media attention, and their people got out of hand, and they shouldn't have. Yeah, and that's all I have to say about it. It's right. um, it's sad, but politics brings out passions in people that sometimes cannot be contained. There you go. Hey, each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Bootsy, Bootsy. and Bootsy was sent in by our friend Dogface Herman, who we love so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear from Dogface Herman a lot with his sheep uh, at, on his farm. They're doing well. Uh, Dogface Herman wrote and said, finally, I got a picture of Bootsy. Bootsy is the barn cat over at the Soul Homestead Farm. Most days, Bootsy walks away when he sees me. And the camera, but this time he allowed me to take his picture. And my response to that, well, is of course he did because he was sitting in a sunny sunspot mm -hmm. and he's not going to move and wake up and move for you and your camera. Of course not. Anyway, uh, Dogface Herman said it was such an honor to get his picture. The one picture I wish I had of Bootsy was during sheep day at the farm. There were lots of people in the barn watching the sheep get sheared. And there's Bootsy up in the hayloft, looking down with disgust, wondering to himself, 
what are all these animals doing in my <laughs> barn? <laughs> Bootsy has a job to do in that barn. I think yes. we all know. We but, know that. Uh, you know, in addition to doing his job, he also enjoys eating freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor or the barn floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Bootsy at our Facebook page or website, and you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, prolefpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job and a labor of love. And we love you. So thank you so much for your donations. Uh, we have heard from a couple people this week who are waiting for their income tax refund to come and promise us a $5 donation out of that. Hey, hey. we understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do understand that. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. You can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties went to go see The Invisible Woman last night. It's this horror movie starring Elizabeth Moss about a brilliant, joyful, highly qualified female presidential candidate who no one can ever seem to remember to mention. I don't think that's what that movie is about, Drift Glass. Ooh, scary, scary. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license, copyright 2019-2020, DGBG Productions.